Everybody and welcome to today's webinar, Equity in Adult Education, the Importance of Cultural Competence and Inclusion. Today's webinar is generously sponsored by our friends at Burlington English, and today we have the always exciting Robert Breitbart on with us. He's going to share a few words with us. Robert? Thank you. Thank you, James, for that, that great introduction. And and hello to, to everyone out there. You're really in for an extra special treat today. We have a, uh, an exceptional presenter and on such a critical topic. And to all of you, thank you so much. Uh, thank you so much to CoAid uh, for all that you do. And to all those in the listening audience, I sure hope if you, if you have any ability to uh, join us either virtually or in person in Seattle uh, for the CoAid conference, please check that out on the CoAid website. I, I know you definitely don't want to miss it. And we at Burlington English have some extra, extra special uh, presentations for you. So uh, again, for today's topic, one of the doing adult education for 30 years like I have, oftentimes I've done it in places where um, not only was it understanding the learners and uh, exactly their travels and trials and, and how to you know, make them feel uh, a, a much bigger part of our programs, but also uh, in so many places I go into, equity can also mean even equity to high quality adult education. And so we're, we're so proud uh, in Burlington English that we provide uh, programs, no matter how big nor small, with the type of true life-changing adult education uh, for everyone. And that so oftentimes means making sure that they're knowledgeable and aware that we in adult education can provide them such a boost to getting uh, really uh, life-changing and family-sustaining, um, you know, uh, occupations that are going to, you know, really make uh, multi-generational, um, you know, advancement and, and change and betterment. Um, typically, also a lot of this uh, where our learners don't have the kind of equity is Oftentimes, particularly for our English language learners, they don't have uh, English spoken around them once they leave uh, the educational learning environment. And so with Burlington English, they have anytime, anywhere access to true audio files of true real life contextual uh, conversational English that they can truly get the access to practice, practice, practice at any time. Um, also just the concept that the equity of we're more than just a place that for the typical program, we're more than just a place to learn English, but that we can also genuinely get you on a career path. And a lot of times that's going to start with helping you building your career pathway portfolio. And that's something we really uh, excel in in Burlington. And that really starts with, with career exploration, because in so many countries, things that we take for granted as far as careers, you just don't, don't exist. So let's make sure that they know about things like the 16 Department of Labor Career Clusters, and even things such as career ladders. Um, and again, as they see occupations that excite them long before they even might even come into contact with a career counselor, once again, they can start saving those uh, jobs and those careers that they're excited about. And they can start building, once again, 
uh, a personalized career pathway portfolio so that even the smallest one room schoolhouse anywhere has has access to some of the great uh, efforts that in, in the past could only be found at much larger organizations. So Burlington English provides you the resources, the tools, the training to make all of that happen. So again, if you're familiar with Burlington Core or our career exploration and soft skills, and definitely our English for specific careers, you know that again, regardless of the size of your program, you can provide them the very best on any type of device. So that's tablets, Chromebooks, uh, you name it, we've got it, PCs, and of course, smart smartphones, uh, you know, or any platform, we're there for them. But the real secret is the Burlington team, which just keeps growing and growing and growing. So please, we have all, the, I have the, all these amazing colleagues and more all throughout uh, the US. So please reach out to us. We'd love to help you in your goals. And now, without further ado, I'm going to turn it back to James and to Sudi. And like I said, fasten your seatbelts because Sudi's just fantastic. Thank you, James. Thank you, Cohen. Thanks so much, Robert. And thank you, Burlington English, for sponsoring today's webinar. Um, I, I say this every time. We cannot do these without you, without your support. Our members are, are better off because of our partnership and your friendship and what you do in the field of adult education and for our members. So thank you very much, Robert. Thank All right, so I'm excited about today's webinar. Our presenter is Sudi Whalen. She is the Technical Assistance Consultant with American Institutes for Research, AIR. Sudi serves as a subject matter expert and trainer in the areas of equity and adult education, career technical education, CTE instruction, integrated education and training, IET, collaborative team building, professional learning community, and community of practice development and sustainability, adult learning theory, and student motivation and persistence. Before working at AIR, Sudi was the lead career technical education teacher at Liberty Adult Education Center in Brentwood, California. Uh, please welcome her by saying hello in the chat box. Let us know where you're calling in from today. And I think she's going to leave time for questions at the end of her presentation. So feel free to submit those in the Q&A box. And with that, I'll turn it over to Sudi. Thank you Thank very much. You so much. Thank you to both of you. And thank you all for being here. Um, so I'm going to jump in and get us started, but I want to make sure I have my chat box open so I can see if you have any questions come in. Um, so again, my name is Sudi Whalen. I work with American Institutes for Research. Those of you who probably know me, probably know me from the CalPro project. That's the California Adult Literacy Professional Development Project, where I am the deputy director. Hello, all my California friends that are on. So great to see all of you. Um, I'm also the deputy director, um, not the deputy director, the director of online learning for the Literacy Information Network and Communication System, also known as LINX. Um, so I'm really happy to be here. And I'm going to go ahead and get started with a quick activity that I like to do whenever I start doing this. I saw something somewhere on a TED Talk, and I've loved doing it ever since. So I'm going to ask you, I'm going to challenge you um, to close your eyes while I tell you a quick story. And I mean that, really close your eyes. Um, I'm going to keep mine open so I can read my story. Um, so to get started, let's do this quick activity together and make sure you have your eyes closed because I want you to picture what I'm saying as I'm saying it, okay? So imagine this is your day. You're going to a technology conference you've been excited for for weeks. You've always wanted to attend this conference. You've been really looking forward to it. The day has come for you to travel and traffic is backed up because of an accident. A police officer waves you through traffic and you get to the airport. You're running late, but you don't need to check any bags. You run to the parking garage, to security, you get through security and you run to your gate. You barely make it to your flight before the doors are closed behind you. As you enter the plane, the pilot comes on and says, hi, you just made it. You go to your seat relieved and you have an enjoyable flight. That night you go to dinner and you have the best food you've had in a long time, maybe even ever. While enjoying your meal, you notice a couple is celebrating their wedding anniversary. Very timely, it's almost Valentine's Day. The next morning you go to the conference and you're so excited to see the keynote speaker. As they step on stage, the crowd erupts with shouting and excitement. Now open your eyes. Now, when you're thinking of that story, was this the police officer you thought of? That's not who came to my mind. Was this possibly your pilot? I didn't see her in my vision. Was this the couple you saw celebrating their anniversary? Possibly, but maybe not. 
was this the technology CEO? Were you imagining Jenny, Jenny Romady, the former IBM CEO? She's kind of a tech rock star, but was that who you were thinking of? Maybe, maybe not. We simply are not, and we cannot be all knowing and completely objective. Our understanding and our views of the world are partial. They're based on our lived experiences and they reflect the circumstances of our particular lives. Like me, you probably didn't picture any of the people who are in the story and that's totally okay. All of our perspectives, including our biases, even down to who we imagine in stories, are framed by our environment, our culture, and our lived experience. We intentionally focus on equity in adult education to assure bias, which we all have, and is completely natural, doesn't affect or impact the education we provide to our students. So now I'm gonna give you my first action step. And don't worry, you'll be, have access to these slides as well. And you can use your handy dandy phone um, to take a quick scan if you would like to access this right now. But the first action step, if you're trying to identify do you have bias or not, is to take a quick implicit association test. Now, it's important to note that there are a lot of different implicit association tests. You can do tests on do you have a bias against people with tattoos? You could do a test on, you know, ethnicity, gender, religion, politics even, um, to see where your biases lay. And it's important to keep in mind that your implicit association test can actually change and your results can change based on new experiences. So for example, if you indicate one day that you may have a bias, but then you have an interaction with people that you had a bias against and a positive interaction at that, the next time you take it, you may not be indicating a bias. This is why it's important when we're trying to overcome bias to really get to know the people and the communities that are impacted by those biases. So that's your first action step and we'll have action steps throughout. Um, I like to make sure that I'm not just preaching to you and talking at you, but making sure that you have access to actual resources and steps that you can take as we move forward. So let's talk about cultural competence. So why does culture matter? Just let's take a couple of seconds and I want you to tell me in the chat, why do you think culture matters? What, what comes to your mind when you think about why culture is relevant? And you can put your response in the chat. Tied to identity, acceptance, so many great answers. Shapes the way that we see the world and each other, wonderful. Understanding other perspectives, awesome. Impacting our view of the world. It's the context for every action taken by everyone. Great observation. Gives you background of your students, wonderful. Shapes our experiences, it's what we live by. Understanding people and their experience, yes. Wonderful, it's tied to how we perceive others, it's tied to how we perceive ourselves. Fantastic, it's about tradition, yes. Culture does involve tradition. Diversity of thought and shared experiences, great answer, Latoya. We need to be able to understand and relate to others without giving accidental offense. Wonderful, Darlene, thank you. Helps in communication, Alan said, great. Wonderful. So yes, all of these answers are you know, very valid and, and, and accurate, right? Culture impacts so many different pieces of our lives until it's the very core of how we, like Michelle just said, understand our students um, and how we understand ourselves and how we were able to later serve our students, right? And be able to celebrate their culture. Thank you for that contribution, Michelle. Global understanding of mankind in all caps, I agree. Thank you. So to get to an understanding of culture, we kind of need to understand that culture goes beyond just our skin tone, our ethnicity, or even just the language spoken. According to the dictionary, Merriam-Webster says that culture is a customary belief, social, social forms, material traits of racial, religious, or social groups. It's also a set of shared attitudes, values, goals, and practices that characterize an institution or an organization. Your school, for example, has its own culture. It can be the set of values, conventions, or social practices that are associated with a particular field, activity, or societal characteristic like us in adult education. It can be the integrated pattern of human knowledge, belief, and behavior that depends upon the capacity for learning and transmitting knowledge to succeeding generations, right? So there's so many different facets to culture. So the term culture includes not only culture related to race, ethnicity, and ancestry, like we mentioned earlier, but also culture shared by people with characteristics in common, such as people with disabilities, people who are LGBTQIA+, people who are deaf, members of faith and spiritual communities, people of various socioeconomic classes, et cetera. There's so many facets of culture. 
So when we think about why does this matter, a lot of these reasons you all, you all captured in the chat already, it informs our identities, beliefs, values, and behaviors. It's a learned part of the natural process of growing and developing in a family and a community unit. It influences societal institutions. It is comprised in explicit and explicit information that groups learn, share, and transmit from one generation to the next, and both organizes life and helps us to interpret existence. It also is often the filter with which we process our lived experiences, right? Like someone already said in the chat. It influences our values, our, access, our actions, and even our expectations of ourselves. Culture also impacts people's perceptions and expectations of others, exactly how you all described it previously in the chat. And I do see that request in the chat for enabling captions. Unfortunately, I don't have the capability to do so, but I hope it can be enabled. Alrighty, so continuing on, what is cultural competence? So this is the next step of this. And I do wanna reference a quick book. Um, you'll see this book, Cultural Proficiency, a Manual for School Leaders. Um, this is what's being cited here. It's a fantastic book. So if you really wanna dive a lot deeper into cultural competence, the six points of, of cultural competence and understanding more about being more culturally competent, a great book to have access to. So according to the National Education Association, cultural competence is having an awareness of one's own cultural identity and views about differences and the ability to learn and build on the varying cultural and community norms of students and their families. It's the ability to understand the within group differences that make each student unique, um, but while celebrating those between group variations that make our country a tapestry. This understanding informs and expands teaching practices um, that are culturally competent in the educator's classroom. So when you look at this definition of cultural competence in the chat, tell me what word sticks out to you the most? Yes, I can say the book name again. It's called Cultural Proficiency, a Manual for School Leaders, and this is the fourth edition. Okay, Susan said the word that stuck out to her was tapestry. That's always the one that resonates with me the most. Awareness, tapestry and awareness, great. Celebrating, yes. Learn, mm -hmm. tapestry, celebrating, competence, awareness, more celebrating, understanding, that's really important. Unique, identity, inform, right? So all of these key words in here, variations, identity. Yes, these are all important pieces of understanding culture and understanding our students and understanding how they engage with each other and amongst themselves, right? And learn and build. Thank you, Deborah. So it's really, it's really interesting. And I love the way this is phrased because I like the phrase tapestry a little bit better than the, the, the word melting pot, right? Because melting pot implies that we all pour ourselves and our cultures into this one thing and it all blends together and becomes one unique thing. But we know in real life, that's not really what happens. Our cultures don't just dissipate and get blended in with something else, right? Instead, they get woven in together. And that's why I like the word tapestry a little bit more because it doesn't mean your culture goes away and becomes something new and unique because it's all boiled together. It means they all get woven in to be create the tapestry that is the United States and is our very diverse population that we have here. So let's talk about the cultural competence continuum. So there's six spaces on the cultural competence continuum. So we have cultural destructiveness, which is see the difference and want to stomp it out. We have cultural incapacity, that's see the difference but make it wrong. Cultural blindness is when you see the difference but you pretend like you don't. Um, cultural precompetence is when you see the difference but you might respond inappropriately, but usually in this area, you're at least trying, right? Cultural competence is when we see the difference, we understand the difference that that difference makes. And then cultural proficiency is seeing the difference, responding positively and affirmingly in a variety of environments. This is where we're going. This is where we wanna drive adult education to. We wanna drive our agencies to, into being culturally proficient. But it's important to note that your agency can't be culturally proficient without your staff being culturally proficient and culturally competent as well. So let's look at that first step and, and drill in a little bit deeper. So when we talk about cultural destructiveness, this is when we have the dehumanization of specific cultures and individuals, signifying that the underlying bias towards the superiority or superiority towards a majority or dominant group, right? And so when we have, we're in cultural destructiveness, this is when we're basically saying that you're different I don't want anything to do with you. A lot of times cultural destructiveness is where all those isms live, racism, sexism, and the obias, homophobia, right? Ageism, those kinds of things. 
Cultural destructiveness is when we're seeing something that's different and we know it's there and we think it's wrong because it's different. And remember, our students are never wrong for being who they are. Our faculty, our staff, our coworkers, our neighbors are never wrong for simply being who they are and the culture that they were born into. And so if we're in the cultural destructive space, that means we're treating that as if we're othering anybody else is different than ourselves. And that's what we try to avoid. When we get into cultural incapacity, this is when we take we have the inability to work with diverse populations. We see the difference and we're making it wrong, as opposed to seeing the difference and trying to stomp it out. When we talk about cultural destructiveness, not only do we make it wrong, but we intentionally try to push it down and quiet and silence those voices and push it aside. Whereas with cultural incapacity, we feel like it's wrong, but we don't necessarily act on what we feel is wrong, if that makes sense. So let's get into cultural blindness. Now this tends to be a sticky point for some people because a lot of us grew up saying, well, I don't see color. I love everyone the same. Um, I don't see any color. I like you for who you are. It doesn't matter what your ethnicity and your race is. The problem with that is this approach is used by the majority typically, and it's perceived as relevant for everyone else. What that means is that if it's okay for you, everyone else can simply assimilate and it doesn't matter what their ethnicity, their gender or anything else is, right? These practices are typically adopted by the greater good, which is generally the majority perspective. This is when we see the difference and we act like we don't. The problem with cultural blindness is that we're ignoring facets of who people are and facets of their culture. If I say I don't see you as a white person, a black person, Hispanic person, Asian person, I'm saying I don't see you for who you are. That is part of your identity. It's part of your characteristics, right? Just like your name is part of who you are. You wouldn't just go change someone's name because you didn't like it that much, right? So then we get into cultural precompetence. This is when people are usually trying. Normally, people don't fall in the cultural precompetence area when they're actually trying to influence um, positive change and things like this. Um, it's this is where you are when you're in the beginning stage of knowing that. You, don't, you know culture matters, you're not colorblind or anything like that, but maybe you're just not sure where to go. And this is when you have the awareness of cultural communication and outreach and the differences that are required there. You might have individuals within the school that desire to provide fair and equitable treatment with appropriate cultural sensitivity, but they may not know how to proceed. So this is typically where people start on their equity journeys. Then we get into cultural competence. This is demonstrated by a commitment to diverse populations in all aspects of the structure and function of the organization. There's a commitment characterized by sustained systemic integration and evaluation at all levels. Um, and it's significant collaboration from diverse populations into the infrastructure of the organization. That means within your staff, diverse voices are heard and listened to, but not tokenized. Remember, you don't bring people into the conversation just because we're talking about diversity today, so we should go get the person of color, or we're talking about women today, so let's bring a couple of females to the table, or we're talking about men's health issues, so this is the one time we're going to ask the one male on our campus for assistance or anything like that. No, we don't tokenize people. We include them on a regular basis in various types of conversation, not just when it comes to diversity, equity, and inclusion. And we're aware of the diverse backgrounds and the diverse experiences and the benefit of having those diverse experiences. This is when we see the difference and we understand the difference and we understand the difference those differences make. So then we get into cultural proficiency. Again, this is where we're really trying to go. This is demonstrated by a centrality of the school's commitment to diversity and by its external expertise, leadership, and proactive advocacy in promoting appropriate care for diverse populations. In other words, we see the, difference, the differences, we respond positively and affirmingly in a variety of environments. Cultural proficiency is more organizational, and you want to make sure that if you're driving your organization towards cultural proficiency, that your staff has all of the tools needed to get there with you. That means professional development. That means taking time to inform them that you have this commitment to equity and what your action steps are planned or that you're doing some investigative work to identify action steps, but bringing them in to the conversation, assuring their cultural proficiency and getting them to the point where they are celebrating and understanding positively and responding positively to all the variances and differences 
of our students. And then a step further to that is assuring that our students understand the importance of diversity, equity, and inclusion, and that they're also being heard in this conversation. A lot of times we tend to do equity audits and things like that, and we dive deeply into staff feedback and what do we look at the data and things like that. But something that can commonly be overlooked is simply surveying your students and seeing what their experiences are like on your campus. And so those are some kind of steps that you do to be culturally proficient and to get to that point. And then you're also making sure that those Versus or voices are regularly heard and you're reassessing on an ongoing at least annual annual basis to identify are we being equitable so here is your next action step and again you can scan these qr codes with your cell phone this is to investigate your own cultural competence by taking a cultural competence self-assessment similar to the one that's found here you can utilize this tool if you like or you can develop your own um, but this is a really great step towards identifying where are we as a faculty or as a staff in terms of cultural competence and do we need additional professional development or additional support Alrighty, so I'm going to go to the next slide. I lost my chat. Okay, so next we're going to talk a little bit about inclusion and what does that even look like when we say inclusion. So when we're talking about inclusion, a lot of times we think that inclusion is specifically geared towards race and ethnicity, but it's not just limited to that. It's not just about making sure that there's representation in regard to race within um, your school sites, your, your curriculum, the different things you demonstrate to students, but also being inclusive of religions, genders, ages, abilities, orientations, and first languages. I want to stop for a second and harp on abilities for just one second, because I've been seeing a lot in the past couple of years where, you know, it's easy to focus on racial equity because that has been in such a spotlight within the last two years, especially since 2020. But we don't want to leave out our students with learning disabilities or physical disabilities. And there are a lot of simple things we can do to make sure we're being inclusive of students with disabilities. Um, and that's including making sure that you know, they can read the content that's shared within your within your courses and things of that nature, checking color contrast compliance, making sure that you have subtitles and captions and things like that on, making sure that, you know, everything is can be viewed and can be navigated by someone who might have a hearing or visual disability, those kinds of things. You're welcome, Kara. That's near and dear to my heart, too. I actually have a T-shirt if you ever want to check out. I think it's from revolt.com. And it actually says, if you embrace diversity but ignore disability, you're doing it wrong. Those things matter. Um, so let's talk about re representation and access and why that matters. So a few questions that you want to consider when you're setting up course content, whether it's a new course, an in-person course, online course, doesn't matter. You want to make sure you're taking into account are all of my students represented equitably in the curriculum and the content. So if you have a large population of Hispanic and Asian students, for example, but everybody in your curriculum is all black and white, right? You're not representative of the population that you have. Um, so you wanna make sure that the curriculum, even down to what you put on your bulletin boards and things like that, show a diversity of student work and a diversity of students that, uh, student examples and things of that nature. And that the people that you're presenting within your curriculum are not always characterized in one specific way. So for example, you wanna make sure that in, in um, your curriculum that the bad guy isn't always a specific um, ethnicity in any kind of narrative writing and reading that you're assigning to your students, right? An example of this, and um, I saw it on Facebook years ago, and it bothered me so much, but it was of two pictures, and one was a picture of a blonde girl with light skin who's all smiling, and the other one is a picture of a, brown, a brunette with darker skin who looks sad, and the caption was about taking care of yourself and even on rainy days and things of that nature, but what bothered me about it was that the only difference in the two pictures, it wasn't even a weather change. It was just the color and skin tone of the character in the image. But it sends the message that well, if you have darker skin and darker hair, that must be negative and lighter skin and lighter hair must be positive. And those are little tiny things that can come up in curriculum that we may not be paying attention to, but can send that subliminal message that darker skin and hair must be bad. 
You also want to make sure that all my students, that all of your students are provided equitable access to curriculum and content. Again, that goes back to access and ability, right? Can your students visibly see? Can they engage with? Do they have access to it? Do they need accommodations? Did they previously have an IEP? Do they have an undiagnosed learning disability? Is there a screening tool you can utilize and refer them to services? All these kinds of things to make sure that students have equitable access to what you're trying to teach them. You want to also ask yourself if your students are provided equitable access to pathways, services, resources, courses, and announcements, and things of that nature. For example, if you have a really diverse population of English language learners in your, in your school, but you're only sending out flyers in English and Spanish, but say your primary other language spoken in your school is Tagalog, right? That's an equity issue because your other students are not able to read those flyers. They're not aware of what that is. If you're sending things out to local schools, right, to promote your adult education program, and you're promoting, say, an ESL class, again, for an example, you want to probably look into what are the languages spoken at home. And I'm going to show you a little bit later in this session how to look for that information so that you can make sure you're providing information in a language that's inclusive and that really can draw them in. Because if I speak Tagalog and everything I'm receiving is in English and Spanish, I may not feel represented, so I may not enroll because I think you don't serve me. But that may not be the case. So you want to make sure you're being inclusive. You also want to ask yourself if your students are provided, well, I already said that. I forgot about one piece regarding pathways. When we're talking about pathways, we have, there's been a tendency to immediately assume if someone has an accent that they belong in an ESL class. That's not always the case. You might have someone who has an accent, but that complete speaks English proficiently. And so we don't want to avoid providing English language learners, people who are in citizenship classes, ABE, GED students, things like that, access to career pathways. Just because we assume they only want to learn a language or we assume they have an accent, they must want to be in ESL. That doesn't mean that's accurate. So we always want to ask probing questions and see what the student's actual needs are before we move forward trying to give them information and things like that. Yes, thank you, Kara. Accents are not indicative of fluency, exactly. And then the fourth point on here is you want to make sure all your students are represented and embraced in their learning environment. That goes back to simple things like bulletin boards, how you post things on your websites and your class websites, your Google Classrooms, within your LMS, things of that nature. Are all of the are you always displaying work belonging to certain types of students or specific students who are like the favorite student? Everybody, every teacher probably has a student that they really like and bond well with. But you want to make sure you're showing a diversity of work that's representative of all of the various types of students that you have. So if if you teach a multi-level class, for example, or multi-curriculum class, then you want to show things from all the different levels or the various types of curriculum. I used to teach in a multi-curriculum CTE classroom where I had various people learning Word, Excel, Access, and they could be a beginning, they could be an advanced. And our bulletin boards represented varying types of students and all of the different types of work that we had. And we did that on purpose so that they could see like whether you're taking Excel or Access or PowerPoint, or even if you're just doing computer concepts, your work can still end up on this board because you're all great, right? And we have high expectations for all of our students. So I'll get off my soapbox on that one. But here's your next action step. You want to, you can investigate inclusion by taking an inclusive self-assessment. It's an inclusive classroom self-assessment and things like that nature. Yes, Rodney makes a really good point. And this goes back to that point about culture, right? What we say in our culture and what the things that we expect is all based on our lived experiences. If what we've been told all this time is blondes have more fun, then that might be how we perceive the world. So if I'm the person that's marketing something and that's what I have in my brain, then I'm going to assume blonde means happy and, you know, a brunette doesn't, things like that. And so it's our job as educators and as change agents to help our students break down those barriers and see that anybody can be the happy, positive person, right? Ooh, yeah, I like that, Christine. She was in a training that brought up the abbreviation English as an additional language, and now it's gaining traction. Love that. Thank you for sharing that. I might start plugging that into my vocabulary. Thank you. So let's talk about data and bias and how that can you know, impact us and things of that nature. So when we talk about implicit bias, we talked about a little bit about bias very early on, but we know that those are the attitudes and beliefs about a person or group on the unconscious level, right? 
it's the preference for one person or lift or thing versus another. Um, and implicit bias typically occurs when that preference is not conscious. Um, it's, but it is influenced by behavior. It could be by our own behavior, by behavior of others. And then our mind tends to process little tiny bits of information based on our previous lived experiences, and that gets converted into bias. Our minds, however, have blind spots. We don't know what we don't know, right? And so if we don't know something about a particular demographic group or culture or anything like that, then we could have a blind spot about them and we might be missing a lot of really good information. We all have implicit bias, the beliefs that we learn from our parents, our caregivers, schools, friends, TV, magazines, and it's impossible for us to always be aware of all of our bias. But the first step in overcoming implicit bias is becoming aware of it. Um, so, you know, there's, it's interesting how bias actually works. Like when you think about it, Here's one example. If you look up Fortune 500 CEOs, Fortune 500 CEOs tend to be taller on average than the average population. This isn't just something I made up. It's actually included in a study, but no one consciously decides I'm going to hire this person as my CEO because they're above six foot, right? That's not something anyone's actively doing, right? Um, so these are just a small example of how implicit bias can work. So taking that a step further, implicit bias can also lead to confirmation bias. This is the tendency to interpret new information as evidence of what we completely believe already. So it's you know just reaffirming what we think already exists. So if you think about social media, for example, the way the algorithms are, are set up is to show you things that are interesting to you, right? And so the algorithm is constantly gonna reaffirm your existing beliefs. That's how social media algorithms work. It's not a slight against Facebook or Twitter or anyone else. That's just how algorithms work. So when we're thinking about those kinds of things, that also means that we may not necessarily be open to other possibilities. So we want to avoid seeing kind of what we want or what we expect to see when we're looking for things and identify and let the facts kind of show us what really exists. And I'm going to give you an example of confirmation bias. This is one of my favorite examples of this. It's a very um, well known, you may have heard about it before, it's been from the memo study. So research tells us that implicit bias can show itself in education through confirmation bias. That's how we score, why we assume things about students, things of that nature. Um, but it's also an unconscious tendency to seek information that concern, confirms our existing pre-existing beliefs. All of us are more naturally drawn to things that kind of confirm what we think to be true, right? So it's our job to challenge ourselves to think outside of that. Within confirmation bias, even when evidence exists to disprove our theories or even disprove our perspectives, we have to think about you know, what that evidence is actually telling us and think about the way that we source students and think about how all these things work. In 2014, for example, a study was conducted um, at a law firm, uh, at a law firm with a number of law firm partners. Each partner was given the same memo with the same exact 22 errors. The only differences in the memos was that one was attributed to an African American author named Thomas Mayer, and the other one was contributed attributed to a Caucasian author named Thomas Mayer. Again, same name, same 22 errors. Now, keep in mind, Thomas Mayer doesn't even actually exist. It's a fictitious, it's a fictitious name. And no one at the end of the law firms knew anything about Thomas Mayer. All they knew was they were going to review these memos, check to see if there were any errors. They had the same 22 errors, same name, just different ethnicities. So when the partners were asked to evaluate the memo as part of a writing analysis study, but the real purpose of the study was to help them determine if they would score the white person and the African-American person the same way. Again, these memos were exactly the same. I cannot stress that enough. What they found was that more mistakes were attributed to the African-American author than the white author, despite the fact that they were exactly the same. The only information they had different was, was the ethnicity. So what this tells us is that when we expect to see errors, we're gonna see more errors. If we assume the African-American person or if we assume the Caucasian person isn't going to do well, then we're gonna score them and say that they aren't gonna do well. Likewise, if we assume that a student is going to do well, we'll be less likely to catch those errors. Only if we're aware of this bias can we actively avoid, avoid this. This is why it's really great to have normed um, rubrics and things like this when you're working within a professional learning community to kind of, sh you can trade off who's scoring whose papers so you're not basing it on what you know about the student, but you're grading holistically and things like that. But yeah, there's a number of different studies and you can um, just go on Google Scholar and research confirmation bias studies. And you'll see that there's a lot of different examples like this where, you know, bias just feeds into how we do things and we, you know, might immediately, we might be more critical of someone we expect to see more errors in. 
So when we think about confirmation bias, data, we can use data to help us identify what students need and additional support, identifying gaps, identify learning gains, but we can also use data to assist us in supporting the devotion of fewer resources to students who need them if we're leaning into confirmation bias. Let's look at a couple of examples of that. So these are two studies that were based on predictive analytics. In one example, um, the promotional requirements um, were affected um, in one example, we had teachers who were looking into, you know, what does the predictive analytics say about the future for our students and things like that. And we, most of us know the promotional requirements or an advancement requirements are typically set to create an equitable space to make sure that we're avoiding inequities as we pass students along. And this is to assure all students at a specific are at a specific level before they get there. So we're setting them up for success. However, in one state, teachers viewed students who seemed unlikely to promote or who were demoted as undeserving of additional help and therefore offered those students less support than the students they that they considered deserving. Educator, educators base the decisions on who would receive help based on who was on track to graduate. If the students seemed as if they were on track to graduation, they received additional help. If they did not seem like they were not they were on track to, um, to graduate, they were considered undeserving or a lost cause, and they didn't get help. And I want to point out, this isn't representative of the entire state of Illinois. This is one specific school district. I'm just not naming the school district on purpose. So when you look at another example of this, there was a high school in Washington that did the same thing, used predictive analytics to determine which of their students were at risk of not meeting promotional requirements and graduating. They provided additional support for the struggling students and saw an increase in graduation rates. The definitive difference between these two examples is that in one case, the data was used to confirm these students aren't gonna graduate, so we shouldn't invest resources in them, and they did not see an increase in learning gains. Whereas on the other hand, the other state decided these students are not on track to graduate. We need to put more support and resources into these students. And they did see an increase of measurable skill gains and outcomes, right? So when we think about these kinds of things, and I want to give you a very specific statistic, Washington saw an increase from 55% to a 78% graduation rate based on using predictive analytics to identify when students were falling behind. So those students were a lost cause. They didn't consider them that. They looked at it and said, it looks like these students really need help. Alrighty, so then we get into data and more about data. Data can be used for a lot of different purposes. It can be used for inclusion and raising awareness about inclusion and equity, but data along, alone cannot guarantee equity, and we know that. To be objective and unbiased analysis of data is important because that can be used in a positive way. Data can be used to raise awareness, identify patterns um, that are related to learning gains or when students are stopping out and dropping out, things of that nature. Um, it can also, if we're, working, if we're working with students, if we're working with our students, data can also help us avoid penalizing students because they, miss because they can't miss work and they have to miss class and things of that nature. You can use data to identify are my students missing class because they just don't care? Or are my students missing class because they have to work and they have to do other things of that nature, right? And you know, and when we're talking about data, there's so many forms of data. We can talk about survey data. You can be looking at your state level data, your school level site data, those kinds of things. We can use data to, to predict students that are on the verge of being pushed out of educational opportunities. For example, a student might be put in a class that doesn't really suit them or meet their needs simply because there aren't enough students to go into that class. And we also know that students are more likely to drop out and stop out if they can't get the classes they need to achieve their goals, right? We can also use data to identify where the gaps are and then work with partner agencies if needed to make sure all our students' needs are met. So for example, if you're fi finding out from a survey or from reaching out with your students or even from doing end of course evals and things like that, that your students are struggling with mental health, childcare, um, housing, all those kinds of things, then you can connect them with resources so they can keep going and try to help keep them from being pulled back. That's not to say that you provide every support service. It just means you identify what the support services are in your area and you can pass that information along. So here are some tools that you can use for looking at data. And I'm going to actually switch a little bit so I can show you what these tools look like. So this is the peeling back the wallpaper document that I really, really like. Um, what it's purposely made for, and this is, was used with permission, um, is for us to you know, identify where do we have some equity gaps and things like that. So for example, if you see that you're looking at your academics, like class scheduling, internships, externships, who has, you wanna look at who has access to internships and externships or career pathways, who is actually using it 
Um, why are they using it? Do you have that information? Looking at why some people don't participate if you see that there's a gap. Then you start looking at the rate of participation by race and socioeconomic status. And then you start doing some surveying and diving deeply in there to see who feels supported and who does not. And then the next step is why do they still support it? Yes, there's actually a link to this in the um, in the PDF that's going to be shared. So all these links and everything like that is included in that PDF that I believe is going to be posted and shared with all of you. So absolutely. So then the next thing is looking at the social emotional supports, right? Counseling, mentors, cultural events. Do we have cultural events for all the cultures that are represented within our campus or only for one or two, right? Those kinds of things. Who participates? Why do they? Why don't they? Um, pathways. Are we leaving out specific groups of people when we're looking at pathways and things of that nature, right? And the reason why we call this peeling back the wallpaper is because when we look at, think about a hotel wallpaper, right? Say this hotel's been around for a really long time. When you pull back that wallpaper, because it looks really pretty on the front, you might find some ugly wallpaper from 1960 behind that, right? And then you keep pulling it back and then there's more stuff that's underneath there, right? So this allows us to pull back that really pretty layer and look deeper into our students' experiences and identifying where the needs and the gaps are. After you're doing this piece up top, you're gonna to take that a step further, further and identify what data do I need? If you don't have the answers to these questions, you gotta figure out what data do you have access to and what data do you still need to generate? So for example, are you looking at counseling logs, interaction logs, you know, those kinds of things. If you're looking at pathways and you do college tours or things of that nature, you wanna make sure you take a moment to see, am I doing those things for all of my students or only for our CTE program, for example? You know, those kinds of things. So once you get that piece done, you've identified your data, you've looked to see who has access to everything, the next two questions you ask yourself are pretty hard. One is, are there any overt inequities? And if they are, you have to identify those. The second one is, what policies and practices are causing this that we need to change? And that's the tricky part, right? Identif actually making adjustments to policy. So we're actually trying to implement a systemic change to create more equity. Oftentimes that means involving district, um, district administrators and things like that to make sure that we can become more equitable. One example of a policy that can really impact equity is, is often attendance policies. If you have students who work full-time jobs, they have families, they have children, they have parents they take care of, uh, maybe they're struggling financially, things of that nature, if we're counting it against the student because they can't come to class because they have to go to work, that's an equity issue, right? And so we want to think about how can we assure that students get the education they need to be successful and that we're not penalizing them for trying to earn a sustainable wage, right? Because that's what we're trying to do, help our students earn life-sustaining wages. So that might be something that you consider. Maybe we allow students to submit activities online. And if they submit it online and it's on time, we don't count anything against them if they had to miss class that day. Maybe we're looking more at assessment mastery and assignment submission and completion and things like that than we are focusing strictly on whether or not they were in the seat. And you have to think about, we can have flipped classrooms, high flex and hybrid classes and things of that nature, even 100% online, that allow you to have your, give your students access to doing things on the interwebs, um, while also still being part of your class, and we can count attendance for that, especially since 2020. We've come so far in being able to capture data for online courses and things of that nature. So really consider, is your attendance policy actually becoming an equity issue for your students? I know for me, that was a problem for me at one point and that my administrator was amazing and we worked towards identifying ways that students could submit assignments online just in case they had to miss class. So, you know, it, it, it means for teachers asking those questions of your bosses and saying, hey, I'm seeing this in equity. Can we discuss this and talk a little bit more about that? And I love that some of you are sharing the awesome things that you all do within your classrooms. I just saw that Lorraine said she gives her ELL students or English language learners gas certificates or bus tokens so they can get where they want to go. Um, this form is actually linked on the PDF of the slides I'll be sharing with you. So the next piece that you can look at, if you're really trying to understand your area, right, you can identify the literacy and numeracy levels of the population within your service area, right? So for example, if I'm way over here, let's see if I can, there's Portsmouth, there we are. If I look at my, my little area and we don't have, we're not in the county because we're different, um, but for Portsmouth City, we can look at where we are in terms of um, literacy and numeracy, right? And see where's the bulk of our students. We currently are below state average, right? And for literacy and numeracy. And you can look a little bit deeper at those things and identify what does that mean? So our numeracy is at 
at 235 and our literacy is at 254. So level was just under level two for new um, literacy and in, kind of in the middle between level one and two for numeracy, which again is below average. Say you wanted to compare your state or your county with another county, you can do that too if you're trying to compare similar size counties and things like that, right? So that gives you an opportunity to sort of see what are the literacy and numeracy needs within your area. Um, it might sometimes it's easier to start up a specific type of program. So say, for example, you're starting um, someone who's um, speaking English as a another language. <laughs> I'm going to work on using legalizing that speak learning English um, and that. And so you're focusing on building up programs that specifically serve English language learners. Right. But if you haven't actually looked at the demographics and the literacy and numeracy needs of your community, you might be building up a program for English language learners when there might be more of a need for adult basic education based on numeracy and literacy. So let's dive a little bit deeper into looking deeper at the data. So if we're trying to figure out information about who our students are, remember we identify the population served, especially if we're trying to do outreach to the community to get more students in our classes, right? Um, it helps to look at your census data. So I always start here at the data tables because it's just fun to explore and look at these kinds of things. So that link is included. But at the top of this data tables piece, there's this little link right here. From here, you can actually type in the name of your city. I'm gonna type in mine, there we are. And it will give you the demographic information about your area, whether we're talking about education attainment, population and people, which also will inform you about languages spoken at home, um, family living arrangement, health, housing, employment, those kinds of things. So as you're developing programs to service students and things of that nature, you want to look at the socioeconomic demographics, you want to look at the literacy and numeracy levels, you want to look at things like labor market information to see where the career gaps are, so you're offering programs that students can get into jobs within your area, those sort of things. Um, but that language is spoken at home piece is really big if you're trying to make sure that your students and the people that you're reaching out to um, are getting information that they can actually read and attain and are understanding that your program is there for them and they're included and they're welcome and you want them to come in. So this is that's your fourth action step. The handout that's linked um, on the QR code is that peeling back the wall wallpaper handout. So if you want it right now, you don't want to wait to get the slides. You can go ahead and scan that QR code on the screen and you can have quick access to that handout. And I'll give you all just one second because I saw a few people in there asked about that. Alrighty, so lastly, on the slides also include a bunch of references, including some of the, um, the different um, the studies that I mentioned and things like that, and a couple of references to some really great books. Um, another one that I really like and recommend is Whistling Vivaldi by Dr. Claude Steele. It really explains how stereotype threat can impact anyone, regardless of demographic. Um, there's literally an example for every ethnicity or gender and stuff like that in here so that you can see how stereotype threat can impact a student. And what that means is that this, the stereotype becomes so ingrained that you start applying that to your life and you feel that that's true. So for example, they have an example of um, white males performance in sports versus black males. They have an example of black males and females and in, um, in literature, Asian females in mathematics and all kinds of different, really different um, concepts. Um, where cardigan yeah, cardigans are important but yes whistling vivaldi great book um great intro story too i'm not going to give it away because i want you to read the book but and then you'll understand the title so i do want to give us a couple of minutes for questions and i'm going to put my contact information up on the screen if you have questions or want to know the titles of any of these books um, or if there's a handout that you that you saw and you're like i didn't get that pdf can you send it to me feel free to email me, I'm happy to provide it to you. I'm all about providing resources and steps that you can take in order to move forward. I'm gonna, um, I believe, so Mr. Bonnie, will there be a recording available? Yes, the recording and the materials will be posted to coabe.org within 24 hours of the completion of this webinar. Wonderful. Um, I'm not sure what, I see a question here, where can I find that poster? I'm not sure which poster it is, so if you, Clarify what the poster is. Was it the one with the at the library? I think I know what you're talking about. This one. I think you're talking about this. This is actually I found this on Upsplash. It's actually in the um, license for modification and reuse. So um, just if you go to my slides, it actually is linked. So it will take you directly to that page, and then you can print it out yourself if you would like. Um, you're very welcome. Um, and then. 
back to the prior slide, I think you were talking about the QR code one. I will go back to that so you can scan that. You're welcome. New resources available. Yes, as a matter of fact, I've purchased a couple of books recently and I would love to share them with you. Um, one is called Courageous Conversations About Race, A Field Guide to Achieving Equity in School and Beyond. This is the 2022 version that just came out in January. I haven't finished reading it. I have the old one. And so I was really excited to see that there's a new um, version put out. So this is a new book that just came out in January. Um, and then this is a book that I really like if you're coaching other people towards equity. If you're Even if you're just working with a team of teachers in a professional learning community and you really want to guide conversations around equity, um, then you have this um, book here, which is called Coaching for Equity, Conversations That Change Practice. So that's um, also really great if you want to look at that. And that's by Alana Aguilar. Um, she's really great with coaching and all kinds of things, but I like the focus on equity. And um, the book uh, by Dr. Singleton, um, Courageous Conversations About Race, just came out. So that's also available to you. And then there's a bunch of things linked within um, within the presentation. And then one other little book that it's small but mighty, it's called Case Studies on Diversity and Social Justice that gives you examples of what to and not to do and how these things turn out. So um, Case Studies on Diversity and Social Justice by Gorski and Pothin. So um, you can tell I have a lot of books, I love books. But anyway, so those are, those are my resources for you. Um, if you have any other questions, please feel free to put them in the Q&A or type it into the chat. Um, I'm really happy, it's, or you can email me. I'm really happy to respond to any emails and requests for resources. If I have access to it, I will send it to you if it's public facing. If it isn't, I'll tell you where you can go to get it. Thank you all so much for being here, for taking the time, for being fantastic change agents. I appreciate all of you so much. Continue doing the great work and thank you again for being here. And there is a poll on the screen. Please make sure you complete the poll. Wow, Sudi, that was excellent. That um, that first exercise that you did, that you opened up with, I don't, I've never seen anything like that or participated in anything like that. And uh, wow, that was uh, that was great. I'm really you. eye opening. Thank you, um, Robert. Thank you. You want to say a couple more words as we close out here? Just everybody, I promised you you'd need seat belts, and I'm so <laughs> glad. Safety first, and just uh, Sudi, I, I sure hope. You are exhausted presenting everywhere. I hope I, to see you everywhere. That I'm was sure I'll, I know I'll see you at CoAve in Seattle. I hope I see the rest of you all there too. It's going to be a great conference. I'm looking forward to it. I, I love the point. It's it's not data points. It's not things on paper. It's people. And uh, James, that's all I say. It's the people like James that make CoAve so special. And it's yes. uh, definitely all my colleagues from around the country who support all of you all. It's the people here at Burlington. So bravo, Sudi. Bravo, James. Thank you. Thank you for all your, for everything that Burlington always does and provides to the field. You're appreciated. And thank you, Coe, for creating a safe space for us to have these kind of conversations and presentations and continue such an important conversation. Thank you. Well, thank you both. This has been an awesome webinar. Um, I want to thank everybody for joining us today from all over the country. Um, I hope everybody has a great rest of the day and a great weekend. I know I'm going on the weekend flying high now. That was awesome. So uh, uh, thanks. Thanks again. Thanks, Robert. Thanks, Judy. And uh, have a great day. Thanks, everybody. You too.